A few years ago, a group of very large men were ooing and eyeing over some expensive jewelry. Uh, this was eight days before Super Bowl 45, and Coach Mike McCarthy came up with an idea to inspire his team. And that was that one day after practice, the whole team went to a jeweler and they got to look at Super Bowl rings. They got to have their fingers measured and fitted so that they know what size to order. Uh, and it got them inspired thinking about uh, being a Super Bowl champion. But there's a problem with this. Like I said, this was eight days before the Super Bowl, meaning they hadn't won a Super Bowl, they hadn't even played the Super Bowl yet, but they're already thinking about wearing the Super Bowl ring. So why do you think a coach would do this? Why do you think a coach would have his team try on Super Bowl rings before they even played in the Super Bowl? Well, to give themselves that champion mindset. The thought was if they start thinking like they already are the champions, then they'll go out and play like champions. And it worked. The Green Bay Packers won the Super Bowl that year. And I know it's dangerous to talk about the Packers in Viking country, uh, <laughs> but isn't that a good picture? It's such a good picture for what we're going to be doing today and for the next few weeks as we turn to the book of Revelation. And when I say the word revelation, there's usually kind of like a little ooh about it because revelation, uh, in my opinion, is probably the most difficult book in the Bible to interpret. Uh, there's lots of pictures in this book, uh, pictures of dragons and the four horsemen and the beast, and it's, it's causes lots of questions, it's lots of numbers and symbolism, and people have a hard time interpreting this book. But even though it might be hard to uh, pinpoint some of the finer details of the book of Revelation, <laughs> the overall theme is very obvious. Jesus wins. Jesus is triumphant. Jesus is victorious. And throughout this book, we see so many pictures of this. We see pictures of heaven. We see what it's like to be on that winning team, to be part of that victory. And the thought behind it is that every single time as Christians we turn to the book of Revelation, it's like God is measuring our fingers, getting us ready for the victory. It's like God is measuring our fingers before we even are in heaven. Uh, so yes, right now, we're not in heaven yet. We're in this sinful world. But as we turn to the book of Revelation, we get this victory mindset. We get this champion mindset that, yes, this world might be hard and difficult right here and right now. We know that victory is still coming for us. And today we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 7. <clears throat> and in Revelation chapter 7, we see a picture of what heaven will be like. And the thought is, no matter what you're going through right now in this sinful world, we know that we have heaven waiting for us, and that encourages us. So we go to Revelation chapter 7 now. <clears throat> <clears throat> After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. So we see this picture into the heavenly throne room. And what we see there is so many people, so many people that you can't even count them all, of every tribe, nation, and background. We see a diverse group of people, people of different backgrounds, nationalities, skin colors, languages, but they're all united. They're all united in what they're wearing. Every single person is wearing a white robe a white robe of innocence and purity and the forgiveness of sins. And they're all united in the message that they're chanting. They're crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. But it's not just the saints. It's not just the people in heaven who are praising God. It's also the angels. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise, and glory, and wisdom, and thanks, and honor, and power, and strength. Be to our God forever and ever. 
So this is a packed throne room. There are so many people you can't even count, and there are so many angels, and they're praising God as well. And as you see here, I put the numbers there. Uh, there are seven praises that the angels cry out. Seven in the book of Revelation. Uh, it's God's holy number. That number shows up throughout the rest of the Bible as well. And here we see the angels praise God in seven different ways, talking about how wonderful the Lord is. They are celebrating the fact that they are in heaven and that they have a wonderful God who saved us. And that is a fulfillment of a prophecy, actually. If you think back to the Old Testament, uh, the, the famous story of Father Abraham. Uh, father Abraham, God came and talked to him before he was actually a father. And do you remember this scene? God brought Abraham and told him to look up into the stars in the night sky. And he told him, count all the stars. And Abraham said, I can't. I can't count all the stars. And God said, that's how many children you're going to have. You're going to have so many children that you can't even count them all. And through you, all nations will be blessed. And what we see in Revelation is the fulfillment of that prophecy. We see all nations blessed through the line of Abraham. Because from the line of Abraham came Jesus. And since Jesus died and came back to life and gives the forgiveness of sins to all people, we see a throne room of God of so many people that you can't even count. Just like how you can't count the stars in the sky, you can't count how many people are in heaven. That's how many people are there. And all nations are blessed through Jesus. Praising God, wearing right robes, holding that palm branch, symbolizing the victory that we have because of what Jesus has done for us. And that's a comforting picture. And it would have been incredibly comforting also for the author of the book of Revelation when he experienced this as well. Uh, the book of Revelation is written by the Apostle John, one of uh, Jesus' 12 disciples, John the Disciple. And he was writing this book from the island of Patmos. Uh, Patmos was a secluded island, and John was living there all by himself. Like I said, John was one of the 12 disciples, and we assume that John was writing this later on in his life. And by this point in John's life, you, you might call him the lucky one, because he was the only one out of the 12 disciples that was still alive. He would have been thinking about how his 11 closest friends were all killed. 11 out of Jesus' 12 disciples, they were put to death in a violent way. They were persecuted because of their faith in Jesus, and they were killed for it. So I guess you could say John is the lucky one, because he wasn't killed for his faith. Instead, they shipped him off to an island all by himself. That's where he's living. He's living on a secluded island all by himself, thinking about how he's the last one left. Uh, and this island, Patmos, it's off of the coast of Turkey. Um, a few years ago, when I was at the seminary, I actually got to take a trip to Turkey. And part of this trip, the plan was uh, that we would actually go to Turkey and that we would take a ferry ride to the island of Patmos. But the day we were supposed to go on that trip to Patmos, uh, the water uh, wasn't cooperating. It was, it was bad weather, and they didn't want to take us out to Patmos because they figured we might get seasick or it might be dangerous. But I wasn't too upset that I didn't get to see the island of Patmos. You know why? Because it was a two-and-a-half-hour ferry ride just to get to Patmos. Two-and-a-half hours on a boat. And we're talking a boat with a gas-powered motor. So that I tell you that just to show you how far away John is from the rest of society. That's John. He's sitting on an island by himself so many miles away from the rest of society and sitting there and thinking about how he is all alone. But in that moment, God gives him this vision. A picture of people in white robes. So many people praising God. John might be thinking to himself, I'm all alone here. I'm the last Christian. Seems like the rest of the world hates Christians and I'm here all by himself. But God pulls back the curtain to heaven and gives him a picture of so many people, so many people praising God to remind John that he's not alone. And how comforting is that picture for us as well? Do you ever feel alone? Do you ever feel like you're the only person that takes your faith in Jesus seriously? 
Do you ever feel like the church is dying? If you ever feel that way, then look at this picture. Look at this picture. Look into the glimpse of heaven that Revelation gives us and see that God's church is not dying. The church is very much victorious. And there's a countless amount of people in heaven praising God for the victory they have right now. And one day we get to celebrate that because of what Jesus has done for us, we too will be there with them. In this world, you might feel alone, but God gives us this picture that you are not alone. Then, one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where do they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So one of the heavenly elders comes down to talk to John. An elder is what we would just call a pastor. So a pastor from heaven comes down to talk to John, and he asks John and says, hey John, do you know who these people in white robes are? And John says, sir, you know. Translation? I don't know. I don't know. You know. Tell me what you know. And this brief little conversation echoes back to a different Old Testament story where we see this exact phrase quoted. Does anyone know what Bible story this echoes back to? It's the story of Ezekiel. There's a story in Ezekiel when God brings the prophet Ezekiel to a valley of dry bones. And he walks up to Ezekiel and he asks me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you know. Translation, I don't know. Can they live? I don't know. And then God goes on to show him that yes, these dry bones can live. And God brings so many dry bones back to life. So when you think again about this little exchange between John and the elder, where he says, sir, you know, just like Ezekiel knows. It reminds us of what happened with Ezekiel. So John says, who are these people? I'm not sure who they are. And the elder says, these are the people in white robes who have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus. These are people who have died and been brought back to life again because of their faith of Jesus. These people in heaven are literally dry bones who have been brought back to life. These are people in this world who have died but have had faith in Jesus that are now celebrating the victory in heaven. And I feel like we need to talk about this phrase, the great tribulation. I say this because at about once a year or so, somebody asks me about uh, this, the great tribulation and the rapture. And there are all sorts of false teachings out there, what we would call end times, talking about the last days when Jesus comes back. There are all sorts of false teachings out there uh, about this. And I want, I want to tell you just a quick story about how I, at one point in my life I fell into this. Uh, when I was uh, a little third grader, uh, one of our neighbors gave us this movie. It's called Left Behind. And I watched it with my mom, and we watched it together, and as a little third grader, it freaked me out. Because what this movie teaches, it presents itself as this is what's going to happen in the Bible, is that there's a rapture that comes where all the believers in this world go up into heaven and the unbelievers are left behind. And for seven years, there's this great tribulation where there's chaos and terror in this world. Um, and that's what this movie's about. And as a third grader, I was like, oh, man, I don't want to be part of the left behind. And my mom looks over at me and is like, did you know this was in the Bible? And I was like, no, did you know this was in the Bible? And we looked at each other like, I didn't know this was in the Bible. Until we read the Bible and we found out it's not in the Bible. <laughs> this idea of a rapture followed by a seven-year period of a great tribulation is a false teaching. And it's very prevalent, I think mostly around like Baptist churches and their teaching. There, there are all sorts of churches that teach these weird ideas about the end times. Uh, so when we go back to this verse... What's it talking about then of the great tribulation? Well, what we would say is that this world that we're living in right now is the great tribulation. Because of Adam and Eve, this world is sinful and corrupt. 
And each person in this room, myself included, has a sinful heart that contributes to that evil, and we do terrible things. And in this world is pain and suffering and hardship and wars and starvation and all sorts of terrible things. This world is a great tribulation. You felt that pain. You've experienced that pain. But God has come up to a solution for that pain. God knows we're living in the great tribulation. God knows that this sinful world at times can be super difficult and hard. But you see what God's solution to that is? He gives us a white robe. He gives us a white robe of purity and innocence. A white robe that had been washed clean by the blood of Jesus. So yes, no matter how hard this world gets, we know that one day we will get to be part of that victory team because our sin has been washed clean by Jesus. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne and shelters them with his presence, never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What we see here is a list of ten things of what heaven will be like. Ten in the book of Revelation is a number of completeness. When you see the number ten, it's talking about something that's complete. And what we see here is how God completely destroys sin. When we get to heaven, we will serve God in his throne room. We will serve him day and night. We will, God will sit on his throne and shelter us from any type of evil that's out there. We will completely be protected because God is there. There will be no more hunger, no more thirst. Uh, the sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. In this world, we wrestle with all sorts of issues with weather and getting sunburn. Uh, but this world was never meant to hurt us. This world was never meant to hurt us. There were never meant to be natural disasters. But when we get to heaven one day, we'll understand that the sun will beat down on us no more. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. We get this crazy picture that Jesus the lamb is the shepherd. The lamb is the shepherd. Jesus is the one who will guide us for eternity and lead us away to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more hardship or pain God will wipe away all tears. What we see here is 10 pictures of what heaven will be like. But to sum it up, we can say this, that a day of victory is coming. No matter how hard this great tribulation is for you, no matter what you're going through, no matter what pain you're experiencing, we can have comfort and hope because we know a day of victory is coming. A day is coming when we will be in God's throne room singing praises to him. A day is coming when we will be surrounded by people of different tribes and backgrounds and we will be united waving our palm branches together and singing praises to Jesus. A day is coming when you won't have to buy sunblock again because you will never get another sunburn because the sun will not beat down and scorch you. A day is coming when God will be our shepherd when God will lead us to springs of living water. A day is coming where there will be no more tears because we will get to be with Jesus forever. Our Savior lives, and because of that, we know that a day of victory is coming. We do this all in his name. Amen. Please stand. <laughs>